do you do are you are you a kidney out the follower or or do you throw that out the window personally i'm a kidney out follower are you do you do that all, all that shtick yeah i would say the vast majority of jews well, I don't know if it's in the world. For sure in Israel, just because there's more Sephardi Jews in Israel than Ashkenazi Jews, but there are more Ashkenazi Jews in America than Sephardi Jews. Yeah, that's the traditional way. I think even Ashkenazim acknowledge that not eating kidney oat is a chumrah. It's a stringency that they adopted that really should be done away with. I think they acknowledge it. The problem is they don't know how to get rid of it because now it's almost like an oath that was taken, really like a shvua because you're born into the faith line of your parents and if your father did something or there's this understanding that if your father did something that you have to follow in the path of your father and his father before him but if that was the case there wouldn't be chabad there wouldn't be breast love i mean these are new movements that means in order that, yeah in order for there to be or to have been a hasidic movement there had to be someone who went against the norm the hasidic the movement was a reactionary that. movement they felt that Judaism was cold and there wasn't enough singing and dancing and issues of the heart being mentioned. So they incorporated ideas of the Arizal and tried to give Jews hope in a hopeless time. And that's really the birth of Hasidus. This is why Chabadniks, they call all those other Ashkenazim who in their mind are not religiously woke. They call them snags. So a snag is basically an abbreviated way of saying a misnagid, which were initially the people who were against the Hasidic movement. Here's an interesting question. Do you think there's a healthy balance that could be met between, you know, cold Judaism and, and uh, the wildness of uh, Hasidut? Uh, yeah, for sure. As long as one side doesn't bash the other. Now, I'm not against people bashing each other if they're doing the wrong thing, if they're hurting other people, if they're encouraging unethical behavior. Uh, but there's enough room in Judaism for an array of different opinions, as long as we all acknowledge that we're brothers and what unites us is Torah. If we have that in common, then it doesn't really matter how you choose to express the theological and the mystical, as long as you know that it can't go against the Torah. And you know that if someone disagrees with you, that's just their opinion and they're entitled to their opinion. The problem arises when you think that you and your rabbi are the only people who are correct. And anyone outside of that circle is a heretic, is not a kosher rabbi, is not inducing this cancel culture. That's when it's not okay. It happens from both sides. In terms of misnagdim and hasidim, it happens from both sides. But yeah, there's a healthy place in the middle. I think it's seen more in places like Israel where there's so many different Jews that everyone puts their differences aside. But in exile, when there aren't so many Jews and they feel like every synagogue feels like they're the light of the exile, that they're saving all the other Jews from being lost completely, that's when the shunning occurs. That's when people start getting kicked out of synagogues. But the behavior is different when, especially in larger communities in America too, you'll find Ashkenazim davening in Persian synagogues and you have uh, Bukharian davening in Ashkenazi synagogues, it's more accepted. But if you're in a small town and all you have is one synagogue, not particularly the rabbi of that synagogue, but the followers of that rabbi are going to mistreat anyone who thinks differently just because the followers don't know that much. Most of the people causing all the hatred online, on YouTube and in the name of Judaism are not rabbis. They're the students of rabbis, people who are new to Judaism. It's rare that you have someone who's been religious over 10 years, over 15 or even 20 years, calling other people heretics and idolaters. No, I think they're more mature than that. People who've been to Israel, who've learned in Israel, who've been to different Jewish communities know how colorful our people are. It's only the newcomers that, I guess to use a Christian phrase, are freshly saved that they start bringing down hail and brimstone on everyone who thinks differently than they do. And this happens even in the Christian world, and I'm sure it happens in the Islamic world too. A lot of these guys misrepresenting Islam or giving it an ugly face are the newcomers, guys who are just so, so eager to express what they feel in their heart that they start trampling on the religious rights of other people. I, I've been there. I've you know when you when you discover something that's powerful, you know, like when I first came to Judaism. You know, I was I was probably the schmuck that was, you know, saying the bracha 
you know, a hundred decibels, <laughs> you know, screaming it. When you know, you you don't know, you know, you know, you you don't know. You, you just you you're quirky when you first come to it. Like the like you you said the the term freshly saved. I think that's a great way of putting it. You just you're, you're a little weird at at the moment. But we have a, a good question from Carla coming in. She's saying that have have uh, satyrs. Both of them have been canceled because of the uh, I guess the virus that's going around. Don't call it China virus. You get in trouble. Uh, it will be two or three of us. It would be two out of three of us. I have never been to a Seder with less than 20 people. So I don't exactly know your question, but I, I guess um, it will, is it, will things change? Uh, does, do you need to have a certain amount of people, uh, Rav, for, for a no. Seder? Or, you don't or need a minion to have a Seder. You could have a Seder alone. You can uh, do it by it, yourself. Wow, okay. Yeah, it's, just, uh, it's more fun with other people, especially if those people could partake in the reading for one person to just read it straight through and what he's going to sing songs to himself. Not that he has to sing, but that's what makes it memorable. All right. Especially kids asking questions, even though in the story, it's children asking questions in real life. It's not meant to be children, but it's fine. It's nice when the kids in the table ask the questions. The Manish Tana. It's a shame how the Jewish community has reacted here in Hollywood. They've closed the synagogues. All the synagogues here are closed. There's one synagogue. There's a synagogue called Aisha Torah that the people are davening outside and they have like 10 feet between each person just for the people who have to say Kaddish. Such a joke. In terms of putting Torah aside, getting people to break your religiosity or getting between you and Judaism or you and God, when it comes to anything regarding health, the Jews fold. And especially the more hysterical it is, the more Jews become obedient and are ready to close down synagogues just to follow suit. It seems like Judaism might even be broken this year by people canceling the seders, all in the name of health. I don't even think that the World Health Organization knows what they're doing, that they've decided to shut down the economies of the West without any discussion, without any debate, without first asking what's the price to be paid for that. I mean, I think more people are going to die because of the decisions they've taken than have already died because of the coronavirus. One thing about Judaism, though, Rabbi, I have to question you on is, you know, Judaism does say, you know, for the for the sake of health, you're you're allowed to you're allowed to, uh, you know, um, how, how could I put this? How can I ask the question? Health kind of trumps everything, right? Not to use the word trump. Well, life. But the question is, are these measures worth it? If someone tells you, like, you know what, don't go out at all because there's a slight possibility that you might get hit by a car. That person could justify not doing anything on the basis of health, right? It's all a matter of degree. How far are you willing to take it? And I think they've gone too far. This whole notion of better safe than sorry really makes us look ridiculous. I mean, there's I've seen many posts of churches refusing to close, still having services, right? It seems that the Jews are quick. Orthodox Jews, I mean, you figure Orthodox Jews are more devout, but they're, they're, they, they close their synagogues just as quickly as the Reformed Jews did. It's a joke. If this was a test, the Jewish people failed it. Okay, allow one synagogue to stay open for those who choose to weather out the storm. But this whole notion of isolation, just because the media tells you to? Well, I'm sure there it. are places where there is for uh, play, people that want to do it, and then there's uh, you know for, uh, for forced lockdown like like Italy. You know, people can't even leave their homes. Uh, the Every synagogue stopped. is shut down here. Every synagogue, oh, all yeah. gatherings have been made illegal. Any gatherings of more than ten people. So could, no. you, could you? Well, ten people's a minion. I mean, you can't really thank the <laughs> Jew for uh, you know. Are they supposed to be rebels? You know, go against uh, go against the government. You know, yeah, well, there's some synagogues that are in people's houses. Why aren't there like minions in people's houses? Like, why are they even breaking those up? Or are people deciding not to dive in? I, ten men is is technically a synagogue, so you don't need a building. Like, why aren't aren't there more people creating minions for Shabbat in their house instead of just canceling everything? And now, davening with a minion is what's called. The, it's a nice thing to do. There's no obligation to dive with, with a minion. You're able to say what's called Davar Shebek Dusha, which is uh, words of holiness that you're not allowed to say if you don't have a minion. It's, it's definitely a great thing. 
going necessary to the synagogue is not necessary. I mean, people nowadays make it seem like it's necessary because of Kaddish, because they've created this notion that if you say Kaddish for a dead relative, uh, particularly Kaddish Shatum, which is the mourner's Kaddish, you bring them one step out of purgatory, out of Gehenna. And if it wasn't for that, I don't think the vast majority of people would be attending synagogue. If they're either saying Kaddish for a dead relative or wanting to help make a minion for someone who is saying Kaddish. Well, even for saying Kaddish, I mean, you can even, can you request a rabbi? I mean, they used to do that at the shul that I went to, the Chabad house. A rabbi would charge uh, people, I think it was six, 360 bucks for a year's of Kaddish or something like this that. This is like the stupidest thing I ever heard. This is, yeah. okay, first of all, like the whole notion of Kaddish is not in the Talmud. Now, yes, Kaddish in general, it was known as first Kaddish de Rabbanan, was something that was said after a portion of Torah or something that constituted Torah was studied. Mourner's Kaddish, in terms of paying someone to say it for you, is identical to Catholic indulgences. The Catholics used to um, pay money before they committed a sin to blot that sin away, even before the sin was committed. In other words, they would almost buy sin credits. They're saying that... I mean, there was a statement made, or there was a saying that goes, when the coins bounce in the can, the chains of hell rattling loose. So if you're paying someone to say Kaddish for you, I mean, it's this was done for people who are going to pass away and don't have a relative to say Kaddish for them. They basically pay for someone to say Kaddish in their behalf after they die. So they're paying for someone to get them out of hell. <laughs> even before they pass away, and presumably for the understanding is that he's in hell because of sins he's committed. But he's able to pay to get himself out of hell while alive. Because who would pay to say Kaddish for someone else? He could say Kaddish. I mean, it's typically people who don't have people to say Kaddish for them, who pay. I mean, it's typically done by yeshiva students. They'll pay a yeshiva student so much money to say Kaddish in their behalf after they die. So that's very similar to indulgences, like basically paying your way out of hell. Now, I don't believe in this whole notion of going to hell and, and in stages and uh, being there for 12 months and having a ladder out and every time someone says Kaddish for you, it's like one step closer to, to Gan Eden. But if you do believe in that, paying someone to help you get out even before you die is silly. Yeah, there'd be people that would walk in and I, I would experience this. People would say, you know, my, my father passed away. I, you know, they, I don't believe in it, and I know you do. And they would and they would tell the rab, say Kaddish for me, and he would leave the shul. And, like, they would force him to do the mitzvah. It, it, people are weird. I don't. Well, he's I getting paid they, for it. I mean, yeah. he's, I mean, it's how he pays the rent. I, I mean, it's not so much on the rabbi saying Kaddish, but the person paying the person to do it. I mean, the rabbi will take your donation. I mean, he buys like, in. Someone has to pay for the chillin'. Right, he thinks it's a mitzvah anyway, so he's obviously going to be willing to do it, right? I mean, if you buy yeah. into it, then, you know, why not? It's a shame what people consider a mitzvah nowadays. It's for sure not a commandment. It doesn't appear in the Talmud. For sure it doesn't appear in the Torah. But it's just, I guess mitzvah nowadays just means a nice thing to do. Yeah, is there is there anything, what, what, what connects to it then? Then what is the uh, source that they use for doing it then? I mean, a, don't we believe that everything we that we practice has to have a connection to the written Torah? Oh, well, no, that for sure not. Uh, just because there's some things that we do that are rabbinic. But this is, is not necessarily rabbinic either. One, it's spiritual in nature. The rabbis don't institute anything as halakha uh, that's solely spiritual. I mean, there could be certain things, even with the Yamidah, we're commanded to say it, and there's there's things that are said there. It speaks about the resurrection of the dead. I mean, there are spiritual concepts that we're commanded to recite. But in terms of Kaddish, it appears in the later Masektot, the later portions of the Talmud that aren't really considered portions of the Talmud. They were added on later. I think Rabbi Kiva's walking through a graveyard, and he sees a guy covered in black soot, and he asks him, what happened to you? And he says... Well, there's this notion that people in Gehenna are able to leave for Shabbos. And he's like, I'm burned like this because I don't have relatives to say words of Torah in my behalf to get me out of this portion of, of hell or of the afterlife. So he convinces Rabbi Kiva to tell his son to say 
something in Torah to do a mitzvah in his behalf to help him get out of Gehenna. The notion of Kaddish is not mentioned here. It later again translated. I think the first time it was mentioned was in the Middle Ages by the Orzerua that tied it into what is known as the Orphan's Kaddish. In English, I don't know why they call it the Mourner's Kaddish because it's Kaddish Yatum. Yatum means an orphan. So they say that that Kaddish in particular, which is something that the mourner, I guess technically the orphan, would say gets that person out of purgatory. Uh, it's not sourced in the actual Mishnah or the actual Gemara. It's a later idea. But people nowadays don't ask where it comes from. They just see who's doing it. right? And if you don't do it, they're like, what are you, you're going against the Halakha, so... That's would uh what would be the um how would it fall for someone who's a gear for someone who's converted to Judaism would they it doesn't Kaddish? really I think the Rabbi Vadi Yosef said once that you could say Kaddish as a convert for your close kin that passed away but every almost everyone disagreed just because technically legally really your parents are not your parents anymore and your your siblings aren't your siblings anymore. I was just going to say that, right, with the whole and plus anti-Gentile settlement in modern Orthodox Judaism. I mean, oh, no, I mean, no, non-Jews. No, because no, they're allowed to say Kaddish, you know, for other people. Uh, I mean, someone could pay a convert to say Kaddish in your behalf. He's still a Jew. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it, it's in terms of him having close kin, then no. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. 